Good evening and welcome to the Jacksonville Environmental and Appearance Advisory Committee. Today is our 35th meeting and our target time was going to be approximately one hour. Um, welcome to all of the members here, here and then Ryan and Gary and Lily. Thank you all for attending. Um, at this time, if hopefully everybody's had a moment to look over it. I know it was emailed out earlier in the week, but um, do we have a motion to adopt the agenda? Motion to adopt. We have second. Second. One of us will second it. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. <clears throat> our agenda is adopted. Um, then we have our minutes from the April 6th meeting. Do we have a motion to adopt or something needs to be corrected? Motion to adopt. Motion to adopt. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Our minutes have been adopted all right and then as you know you can always make sure your attendance report is correct and if there is something that is not right just let Glenn or the staff know and they'll get that situated for you so tonight um, it is time that we do our election for chairman and vice chair Glenn do you want to give some update or insight on that or you will find in your agenda the um, the ordinance on page nine, which requires to have a term of one year, and you can succeed yourself. So therefore, that it means that both um, uh, Ms. Holden and Suzanne can serve a successive term as chairman. However, Ms. Holden has informed us that um, she is she's going to let her term expire and um, not come back on. We're sad to hear that, but she has a noble cause that she's going to be um, um, fighting for and trying to do there. So the first thing to do is to elect a chairman, and on behalf of you, um, um, Ms. Nelson, then I'll conduct this part. And um, are there any nominations for the um, for the position of chairman? I will nominate Suzanne. <laughs> <laughs> are there any other nominations for position of chairman? If not, would someone entertain a motion to elect um, um, uh, Ms. Nelson as chairman? And to um, have by acclamation. I Make a motion. motion. Yeah. No, you go ahead. You start. It. <laughs> <laughs> There's a motion. That we um, nominate or have uh, Suzanne be our chairman for the incoming year. Uh, acclamation. acclamation. <laughs> Absolutely. And Mrs. Blizzard, I see you second it there. All in favor of that motion, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, say nay. All right. And. You may now take congratulations on another term. Oh, it begins. You. It technically begins July 1st. <laughs> so Ms. Holden is still vice chair until um, till that time. Um, anything you all want to say or anything, Ms. Holden or whatever? I really yeah, hate to job. see you go. Mm -hmm. well, you have been a blessing to this committee. Your sweet smile is just <laughs> blossoming to us as a flower. Your youngness in this committee has been <laughs> great. Yes. Your energy okay. level. I've really enjoyed it. It's been a real treat to be on the committee with you all, and I will miss coming on Thursdays. I was watching on TV. But, um, <laughs> you know, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's been a real treat, and you guys are doing a great job, so I'm sure that will continue that good work. Well, equally Thank so, you. then, you may conduct this part, since you're chairman uh, for the election of the vice chairman, or you can have me do it either way. It's up to you. Uh, you I mean, you do I have put some thought into it, um, and I hadn't really spoke to anybody. I, I do know a few of my friends in here who, who probably would like to pass on it, so... Um, I won't put you under the under the bus there. Sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, sunshine. No, but I didn't know, and this is just a thought that I had. But I didn't know maybe if Miss um, Webb would might be something that she may be interested mm -hmm. in doing. Um, mm -hmm. I just that was my thought on that. But um, it's definitely open for suggestions if y'all want to nominate some other folks or. No, are you willing to do that? <laughs> are you willing to do that? Floor is open for nominations and motions. <laughs> I nominate Miss Gina. Mm -hmm. That's it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have a motion. Are, are you? Well, up? We have a nomination. Or nomination. <laughs> Do we have um, any other nomination? Any other nomination? You may also ask for someone that may wish then to elect um, Eugenia Webb to the position of vice chair, effective July 1st, by acclamation. 
anybody? <laughs> what he said. <laughs> yes. All right. Betty's made that motion. Then. Oh, you need a second right. now for that. I second it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You may call the All vote. Right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Perfect. Any opposed? <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I would do a great job. Great. <laughs> we, know you will. we know you will. <laughs> so we do have a couple presentations tonight. Uh, Lily's going to start, but before we get started, I want to thank y'all in advance for coming. I'm going to have to sneak out because I've got to go to Reed's award ceremony here mm -hmm. shortly. So. Don't think I'm not interested when you see me mosey on. <laughs> and the same thing, Ms. Williams is going to step away for an academic um, um, banquet this evening also, our presentation as it is right. there too. So, Ms. Gray, we'll call on you. All right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Right. Um, it's a pleasure to be here before you tonight as we do this every year to bring you up to date on what's going on in the Development Services Department as relates to our Clean and Green initiatives. And I have with me tonight Gary Willett, who will talk with you about some code enforcement efforts, and Ryan King will follow with updates for planning and permitting. Just as a reminder, um, the Clean and Green initiative is designed to improve the overall appearance of the city, and you, you guys are well aware of that with all the major landscaping that's been going on in the city. It looks really beautiful, our bypass improvements and things of that nature. We also, on the community de development side, um, work on the physical infrastructure, such as um, demolition of our housing stock, abandoned and dilapidated structures. So we have demolished 100 structu structures since June of 2010. We're real proud of that. We've taken areas that have looked like this and had houses that look like this, mm -hmm. and we have removed those and replaced them with homes that look like this. So this is definitely contributing to a clean and green Jacksonville and improving the overall appearance of the city. We are able to do, do that because of the funding we receive from our Community Development Block Grant, which is targeted to low and moderate income households, but it's also targeted to uh, removal of slum and blight conditions, which supports the clean and green efforts here in the city. We use those funds in a number of ways uh, citywide, and what you just saw was some uh, funding that was invested in our downtown area. We are also able to use those in some of our older neighborhoods, and we're working with the, within the New River areas, such things as renovation of the Piggly Wiggly building in partnership with Onslow Community Outreach is another physical improvement that we're able to partner on. And then, of course, you've heard about our Office of Livable Neighborhoods initiatives, where we're working directly with neighborhood groups to um, improve older neighborhoods, and we're Real proud of the work that has been done in Bayshore Estates and Belfort Homes, and we'll be working to identify new neighborhoods here shortly. And then, as you know, what that does is it's a link between the neighborhood groups and city resources. So the Office of Liv Livable Neighborhood Re Neighborhoods represents basically the front door, the face of the city as relates to neighborhoods. So they're able to contact us access resources such as code enforcement, utilities, transportation, any issues that they have in the neighborhood, we work with them really closely to um, get those addressed. And with that, since code enforcement was on the top of that list, because that's one of the main complaints <laughs> we get when we go into a neighborhood is the high grass and weeds and structures that are um, not looking so, so beautiful and pretty, I'm going to turn it over to Gary. I think that's the only time we're ever on the top of a list. <laughs> Uh, good evening. Thank you for having me this evening. Again, my name is Gary Willett, and I'm the Chief Zoning and Code Enforcement Officer for the city. Uh, the Code Enforcement section falls under Community Development, Ms. Gray, within the Development Services Division. We have three Code Enforcement officials on the city staff, myself and two other Code Enforcement officials that work uh, the entire city limits and some portions of the extraterritorial jurisdiction. We're charged with enforcing the um, portions of the city code as well as the unified development ordinance. Under the city code, we enforce the public nuisances, which is your high grass, weeds, trash, debris, some noise uh, <laughs> violations such as um, barking dogs, things of that nature. Other noise violations are handled by the police department. Um, we also handle odor complaints, um, animal complaints such as uh, 
the number of animals uh, people are keeping within their residence and things of that nature. Also under the city code is our junk vehicle ordinance uh, with regard to repairing ve vehicles, storing vehicles, uh, things of that nature in residential areas. We're also charged with uh, enforcing portions of North Carolina State Building Code with regard to minimum housing standards. Now, we are not certified building inspectors. However, we inspect dwelling units for minimum standards of habitability. And I'll go into that a little bit, as well as non-residential structures, your commercial buildings, and the condition that uh, they're required to be maintained in according to the code. And then zoning ordinance and I apologize, this slide should be updated to read now the Unified Development Ordinance, which is the city's land use regulations, where we're charged with after uh, a developer uh, gets approved site plans or residential uh, construction from Ryan's office in planning and permitting, once the construction starts or is completed, we're charged with uh, inspecting to ensure that they meet those requirements and design standards established by the Unified Development Ordinances, <coughs> excuse me, for such things as setbacks, uh, the position of the structure on a building, uh, parking lots, striping, signage, landscaping, and uh, some uh, ADA handicap accessibility. So the three officers we have in the city, we have our plates full, we have a challenge, but we, I think we are making great strides in uh, keeping uh, the council's initiative on cleaning green and also what you as a board do and bring to the table. Our code enforcement process uh, starts out, we try to be proactive, although with our limited resources, uh, especially in the summertime, we're mostly com complaint driven. Um, if we get a complaint within a neighborhood about a particular property, we try to be proactive and not just focus, go down the street to that one property, take care of business and leave. If we see other potential violations of codes in that neighborhood or on that street, we will take appropriate action at that time. Every complaint is acted on within 48 hours. Uh, once we do our preliminary investigation or inspection, we come back to the office and we will serve notice to the property owner, either by placing a notice on the door, a first notice, what we'd like to call a courtesy notice, which is very temperate in language and solicit a property owner's uh, cooperation in correcting a violation. If they fail to do that within three to five days, then we go out with official mailed notice to the property owner record directing them to correct the violation. Uh, if the owner fails to correct the violation, then we have, the council has given us resources with budgeting uh, that we can go out and contract abatement, which requires <coughs> us to go to the magistrate's office, get an administrative inspection warrant, uh, get our contractors on the property, and any cost incurred uh, for the contractor's fee, plus a $200 administrative fee, which council has approved in the fee schedule, is assessed to the property owner as a lien on the property and is placed on their tax bills. Uh, here's some examples of high grass and weed. Uh, I will tell you, when we get administrative warrants, we only get warrants to go on vacant properties. We will very, very rarely <coughs> go and get a warrant on properties that are occupied. Uh, we, we haven't had to do that too often. Um, normally getting people to sit at a table and convincing them and you know, outlining the consequences of the failure to comply and gets the job done. But as you all well know, there's a lot of uh, unoccupied properties, vacant, I don't want to say abandoned, many, many homes in foreclosure, as you all well know. And these are the properties that we're 
we're having to get warrants on to get taken care of. Here's some examples of the trash and debris. These are actual photos of cases that we've handled in the past to get property owners to clean up their properties. Uh, stagnant water and pools, breeding grounds for uh, mosquitoes, rats, snakes, and other vermin. Those are all violations of code. As far as our vehicle ordinance goes, uh, a junk vehicle, a vehicle is not required to have current tags on it. That's not a violation of any code. But a violation of the code is a vehicle that is inoperable, partially dismantled or wrecked, cannot be self-propelled in the manner in which uh, it was uh, manufactured to be. Uh, nuisance vehicles are those vehicles that are leaking oil, uh, gas, uh, they, uh, they're up on lifts and pose a dangerous situation of falling, hurting someone. And I did want to point out specifically that we don't deal with just cars and trucks. Anything with a motor is considered a vehicle. So we also deal with boats, campers, trailers, jet skis, uh, riding lawnmowers. Those are all considered vehicles, and if they can't operate in the manner in which they're intended, then they're in violation of code. Some examples of some not so useful vehicles. <laughs> Our minimum housing codes that we handle, uh, we deal with the structural integrity of a dwelling unit uh, with regard to its plumbing, uh, mechanical and electrical, sanitary conditions, and uh, life safety issues. Now these are things where mostly, and it's not so much owner-occupied, but tenants who have challenges getting landlords and apartment managers uh, to correct things that uh, they consider uh, not up to code. We will go in, we'll do inspection, and the state code requires minimum standards for habitability. They don't have to go in and take a home that was built in the 50s or 60s or 70s and upgrade the entire electrical system or plumbing system, but they do have to have uh, safe, operable living conditions and healthy sanitary conditions to be an acceptable dwelling unit. Uh, these are some of the minimum housing cases that we've worked in the past and working with Lily's Community Development Department and her programs. A lot of these structures no longer exist. We've gotten them demolished and removed and either uh, rebuilt on a property or now they're just vacant property. Uh, here's some of the numbers for uh, the complaints we've had. We have... Uh, when you, fiscal year uh, 15 and fiscal year 16 cases, I will tell you that um, in FY15, we handled 2,889 cases amongst three officers. Um, 2,016, 2,900, not that we didn't work any harder, we just may have changed focuses. Uh, for some periods of time. But as you can see from the slides, uh, our complaints come from citizens, uh, employees, uh, the police department. We have our sanitation department, our streets department. All of these city employees are very conscious when they're out working on the streets or in the neighborhood and they see violations of code. You know, they're an extra set of eyes for us because we can't be everywhere to see everything. So they're a valuable resource for us. Um, number of cases we've worked, uh, I says um, in, you can see where uh, our initial inspections and notices that go out, our zoning inspections, those are our land use inspections uh, based on new construction or uh, additions uh, that come from uh, planning and permitting and site plans. 
So with that, do I have any questions? Or Lily, if you wanted to add anything? No, Mr. Hargett? <laughs> I've got a question. When you said yes, y'all demolish those areas with houses on there, and then you said, or we build something on, are you talking about the city, or are you talking about through the city by private organizations? Well, Lily can talk to that. Uh, Both. Um, in some cases, the city will acquire the property, and we, we will rebuild on, the, in, on those lots with partnerships with private developers. <coughs> in some cases, the private sector owners will rebuild um, on their own lots. So we just provide a clean slate, for lack of a better word, for redevelopment to take place. So it could be a partnership with the city or it could be privately done. I have a question. Um, if you see <coughs> in the area where there's trash that's been thrown out mm -hmm. from the house and just out almost in the street, is that a violation? Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Um, the, the code specifically defines a nuisance as accumulation of trash, debris, uh, junk, but it's anything that contributes to neighborhood blight, depreciates property values, um, can become a harborage for snakes, rats, vermin, and interfere, interferes with the comfortable living of the adjacent property owners and the neighborhood. That, that's the book definition of a nuisance. And any type of nuisance uh, is a violation of a code. And I will also add, in the, in, the, in the cases where the city purchases the lot and rebuilds the house, then we're also able to sell those homes through our first-time homebuyer program. So there's a lot of uh, pieces that come together with our down payment assistance program to help um, homebuyers get in those homes. So some of the pictures that you saw with the old pictures of downtown and the new homes, that's all part of our neighborhood revitalization strategy. <coughs> where we <coughs> strategically took down those properties, acquired the lots, partnered with developers, rebuilt, and then resold those homes. So now we have homeowners in the neighborhood. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Interesting enough, you all kind of stole my thunder a little bit. I'm going to go off script, and I plan to do this really about five, ten minutes ago. It made me think about it. That uh, picture that Lily and I have talked about, you know, many times is, is this picture right here. And it's a testament of what Lily has done with her leadership mm -hmm. and the coordination between departments within the city organization, where this picture right here was taken within the last 15 to 20 years. Now, this is Tony, who used to be uh, an employee here with the city, mm -hmm. with CD. And this is the same corner. Oh, wow. Beautiful. And it's a testament to what Lily and, and, and everybody involved with, with her program there, from the, from the demolition of these houses, the purchase of the land, the CD program, the CD funding, first time home buyers where we took that block from this and turned it into this, gave three people probably their first time first homes. Time. Mm -hmm. You know, gave them a chance at home ownership. Mm -hmm. The the lots will be free and clear at no charge to them provided they live there for what, 10 years? Ten years. Oh. So as long as they live there 10 years, the, the second uh, mortgage, I guess, on the lot will, will go away. So they will end up with that lot for free. Uh, and just a testament to kind of multiple divisions, departments, and programs working together. And as I think Lily mentioned a few minutes ago, they just recently demolished their 100th structure in in the last, I guess, of five to eight years, something like that, yeah, that we've been. Over five years. So 100, 100 houses like this that basically were just aged and most likely not lived in, and in some cases lived in, but didn't need to be. And this is the kind of neighborhood where had the city not gone in, it's very, very unlikely that the private sector would have been the first in. And so this is where your public investment spurs private development. So when, you, when I see those three houses, I also see jobs for all the contractors that worked on it and the, the, the construction workers that were employed through that program. And so I see the city's tax base going of tax value on the houses before versus the tax value on those houses now where the taxes that the city's collecting is much greater. I see law enforcement that does not have to spend time and resources in that area that they were doing five years ago, that they don't have to invest a whole lot of energy in that area. So I see uh, cost savings to the city, I see revenue for the city, and I see just a place now where 
people want to come back to live, all because of the, the um, dollars that we were able to invest in the partnerships that were created. And it gives you a clean and green mm -hmm. neighborhood. Um, so it's a beautiful place now. It is. Um, moving on to the planning and permitting side of things, I wanted to talk with you about a couple of topics tonight. And four, four things, three real things, and then the, the fun's always, well, what's coming to Jacksonville? So we always like to, to kind of share that for the boards and commissions and, and city council, and then also for the viewing public that may, you know, wonder what's coming. And um, so these are the talk, talking points tonight. So I'm going to touch base on, on the billboards, specifically the LED billboards, uh, lighting standards that our UDO has uh, that we've been enforcing since it was adopted in 2014. It's a fairly new thing. We didn't have lighting standards prior to that. Some recent changes with the wireless telecommunication towers and some changes in technology. And then the what's new part. So just uh, a real quick deal with the our overview of the of the LED uh, well, billboards in general and LED billboards. Uh, the area on the map here is the city limits and the ETJ. The area within the red is the only locations that billboards can locate. It's called the billboard overlay zone. So we limit the locations in which they can go. We also have spacing criteria as it relates to billboards. So as you can see here, um, denoted by the black triangles are where all the billboards are in town. There's 89 of them. And some of them are one-sided, but most of them are two-sided. So we refer to those as faces. So there's 166 faces. And that's important for the LED part here in a moment. And as you can see, there's some that are outside the overlay districts, which means they're grandfathered. They can remain. They're, they're non-conforming. And really, with the spacing criteria that we have, we're not going to see any new ones. Uh, in the last 15 or so years, I think we've only had one or two permitted because there just really wasn't any space left. So a few, um, about, it's probably about two or three years ago, four years ago, we had some, some discussions with the billboard industry and, and it kind of went quiet. And then uh, we had uh, some more recent discussions. And as a result, in October of 2016, I believe it was, so since our last meeting last year, City Council heard a proposed ordinance amendment to the UDO, or Unified Development Ordinance, and they approved uh, the ability to allow up to 10% of the billboard faces to convert to LED. And some of the additional provisions are if it's 60 feet tall, we have a maximum height of 40 feet. So if you want to swap a 60 foot tall billboard to an LED billboard, you have to bring it down to 40, 40 feet. Some of the billboards we have, not many, but some are a little bit over 400 square feet. They're in the 600 square foot area uh, variety. We have a maximum size of 400. If they want to um, convert one of those to LED, they have to stop at 400 square feet. They can't put back a, a 680 square foot LED billboard. So it's kind of a win-win, if you will. We get some, some size um, reduction, uh, and they get LED billboards out of the deal if it, if it works out that way. And I'm not sure oh, I'm pressing the wrong button. That's why operator error there. So um, they approved an ordinance amendment that basically uh, allows 10 10 of the faces to become LED. We've had about let's see, I may be getting ahead of myself. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, there's some limitations to where they have to freeze or go blank if it starts to malfunction. They can't flash. Uh, DOT and the city both prohibit that. They can change every eight seconds. Uh, there's some lighting standards about how bright the billboard can be. Uh, there's also, uh, we require that because these structures are supporting a lot of weight, especially when they change them to LED, that some of those structures may be, may be aged, that they have to prove that the structure can support the weight of an LED billboard if they decide to, uh, to, to swap it out. And if it cannot support it, we do allow them to modernize. And what that means is they can, you know, redo the base and make it stronger so that, or put in a new base so that it will support the weight. And um, we added some other, um, some definition and some clarity to the code. And basically what it means is, is that 20 faces, up to 20 faces, can be swapped to LED. So we'll see no more than 20. LED billboards in Jacksonville as it stands today. 
We've permitted 10 to date. I think there's two that have been installed, only two. So there's some others that are probably in the work, in the works. And one of the, the benefits that the city has to this is, is the public benefit. And as you can see here in the screenshot below, this is from one of the two LED billboards that we actually get to put out public service messages and things like that at no charge or we can we can rent the space as well but we have the ability for so many per cycles that we can have information advertised and then if there's an amber alert or some sort of an emergency situation uh, we have the ability to convey messages similar to what we do with our ITS boards that we have around town so um, you'll start to see a few more of those go up as I stated 10 permitted and we've got two I think that are installed and working today in the city's jurisdiction there are one or two or three that are in the area that are not in the city's jurisdiction. So those don't count towards those numbers. Mm -hmm. Nor can we control them. Correct. Any questions on the LED billboards? I'll stop after each section and, and see if there's any questions. Just one question. It's not about the LEDs, but the regular billboards, the wooden one, is that what they're called? Do they have a width and height standard um, maximum? Yes, they do. Oh, okay. And if they wanted to modernize them, the general statute allows them to do that. So they could swap them out to a steel structure. Uh, they've just mm -hmm. opted for whatever reason not to in most cases. But that <coughs> may be something that they do moving forward. Yeah, thanks. Especially if that's one they want to convert to LED because it wouldn't support the weight most likely. All right, well, we're going to move on to another um, uh, aspect of the UDO that we did not have prior to 2014, and that is lighting standards. And some people may say, well, why do you need to regulate lights in, in, in the city? Well, interestingly enough, there are um, studies that are out there that, that show that it, there's negative impacts on the environment. And uh, as it relates to lighting. So just to go over a couple of, of short things there. Uh, why lighting standards? We want to make sure that we protect the military mission. So when they're, the helicopters and the Ospreys are flying at night doing their night training, uh, light pollution can impact their ability to train so that they're ready uh, when the time comes. So we want to make sure that we protect the military mission so that they want to stay here and train here uh, since they are such an economic engine here within our community. It also uh, promotes energy conservation. Uh, there's a lot of energy that goes into lighting um, that really just goes off into space. If you've ever seen some of the cool satellite imagery uh, taken from nighttime about the light pollution, it's pretty, it's pretty neat, mm -hmm. but, but not good. I mean, it's just amazing that the satellite imagery can capture, you know, the light that's basically not directed downward. So I mentioned environmental protection. I think the most common one that, that we probably think about is uh, living here in coastal North Carolina is the, the sea turtles when they, they come on shore to nest. You know, if there's lighting on the beach, that kind of impacts their migration and coming back to, to uh, lay their eggs. Mm -hmm. Same thing, birds and just everything. Even uh, the, the, the stuff that it has on a human body, you know, our ability to go outside and look at the stars at night, for example, is one little thing. So, I mean, there's just different things to think about. It's some interesting reading. Um, and then light trespass. And what I mean by light trespass is when you have a commercial business that's very close to, say, a residential structure and the folks can't sleep at night because they can't, um, th their room is illuminated so brightly because of their adjacent uh, development. And we've had a few of those complaints over the years. Uh, and and this, this ordinance, uh, piece of the ordinance allows us to kind of limit the the foot candles at the property line so to kind of give you a, um, an overview we want a dark sky standard and basically the general gist of it is we want lights that aim down because that way you're not creating glare which is an impact on drivers when you're driving down the street and the lights glaring and you're facing your vehicle and it can be blinding and it's also not spilling upward so um, you know, the area in yellow is kind of, that's the area that you're desired to light. Uh, but if there's no standards, then it can project outward or up. So within the UDO, it's a very simple set of standards. It's pretty much we have two maximum heights, one for commercial and one for when you're adjacent to residential. 
And then we also have uh, foot candle maximums at the property lines. And that can be determined based on a photometric plan that I'll show you here in just one second. And also with a uh, light meter uh, in, in the field. And I already mentioned dark sky standards. So this is an example of a small site plan with a photometric plan. So the circles basically, in the middle of the circles, excuse me, are where the two light fixtures are. This is a new, I believe this is the site that's on the Jeune Boulevard that um, the pawn shop that burnt recently and they're going to rebuild. This is the lighting plan. And all the little numbers that you see around, that's basically the foot candles that the light is going to put off. So at the proper lines, we make sure that it's not more than 2.5 foot candles. So it just kind of keeps, you know, from being, you know, overbearing on the adjacent property owners. Now, in the middle of the site, it could be 8, 10, 12, you know, brightness. It, it's okay. It's, we're looking at it in terms of spilling over to the adjoining property owners with the light trespass, and then we want the dark sky standard. And that's all I have on light standards. Any questions? Or? I have a question. Okay. I was wondering, are there any hope or any discussion of ever tinting some of like our street lights in our neighborhoods? I feel like they are so bright unless you wanted to just play outside all night. <laughs> I mean, it's great if you're walking, but mm -hmm. we don't need night lights because they're so bright. Uh, my, uh, I'm going to go with an, my assumption here is that we've swapped out to the LED yes. and the LED... Right. It's it's a whiter light, whiter yes. mm -hmm. in color, and they can be bright. Do they ever dull? <laughs> <laughs> Dim. It's possible that it, you know. Is it every one of them, or is there one in particular that oh, seems no, worse than the, the rest whole, of them? I mean, you know, we used we grew up with like those nice nostalgic yellow glow lights <laughs> that probably ate up a lot of energy, but um. But yeah, they're just really bright. So I thought maybe we could spray something over the, <laughs> you know, just to dim it a little bit, just a little tint. And I mean, I'm sure that's like a huge controversy to somebody, but I think it's a good idea. We'll, uh, we'll share that with uh, <laughs> I'm sure they want to hear that. If there's something that seems, you know, unlike, say, the, the next five or six poles, oh, no, it could be that the there's same. an error just in which, you know, <laughs> it's directed downward. Um, but, you know, that's something we can we can pass along. But, um, you know, I think the other part of that is also the security aspect. I mean, there is a desire yeah. for some security as well. So. Oh, sure. And we appreciate the security. I just like to look at the stars, too. <laughs> I got you. Any other questions on lighting? Okay, we'll move on to a, a fairly hot uh, topic for us right now, and that's wireless telecommunication towers. Everybody's got smartphones, right? We all want to be able to surf the Internet, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that stuff. So it, that requires bandwidth. And um, in the past, you know, this is what we think of with, with wireless communication towers. There's a new animal in town, and it's 5G. It's coming soon. And based on what we're hearing, uh, along with everybody who wants to be on their smartphones, there's going to continue to be a higher demand for uh, service. And there's a limited range of available higher frequencies, which means, and there's some economical things, but it's cheaper to backhaul and, and things of that nature. Uh, the industry has stated that they're going to need a space every four to 500 yards per carrier. And there's four carriers. So you can imagine you're going to need a lot of antennas. So we currently have these installations here in town. Um, you may not even realize it, or you may have seen them. And Hannah, I wonder what that was, and now I know. Mm -hmm. This is actually right across from the, high, uh, the um, hospital on Memorial Court. And what you have here in the picture to the left is one of these green boxes on the map to the right. And it's basically a small cell wireless. So this has got, I believe this has got two antennas on it. And you can see there's two boxes. There's a box on the ground. And there's also a brown box on the pole. And that's for the equipment. So we've had about, I think there's 30, 35 or 36 locations that these have been installed over the last couple of years. And um, these are all Jacksonville examples that I've given you here. Uh, the one in front of the new fire station, two is the one on the left. 
and the next two are <clears throat> on outside of Belks, next to Doctor's mm -hmm. Drive. And we've got this one here in Northwoods. So if these two houses, if that was one of your houses, then you know, you're looking at this uh, brown equipment box and two telephone poles and an antenna out front. And that's that's really, I mean, the need's going to be to deploy these type of antennas to keep up with the demand. So um, a recent uh, animal that came in to the, the fray is the, the company's wanting up to a 180 foot tall tower next to the street within the within the city or state right of way so as you can see in these two examples i don't know that these pictures really do it justice but if you could imagine 150 180 foot tall tower right next to the highway so that caused us to uh, go back to city council and <coughs> discuss their ordinances that we had in place and we brought back to City Council a proposed amendment, which they adopted, and part of it includes uh, the first part here, which is expert assistance. So we basically have a consulting firm that uh, looks at all of the applications as it relates to eligible facilities, which is a co-location, uh, the small cell wireless, and then also for new cell phone towers or wireless telecommunication facilities. It doesn't cost the city anything. The developer pays the cost to have our consultant review the applications. And they serve as our liaison between the industry and, and staff and city council as it relates to understanding the federal rules and laws, what we can and cannot do, and help us make informed decisions. The other thing is that we could have a company turn in 30 or 40 applications at one time, and we have to turn over those permits within 30 days so we could find ourselves in a situation where you know not enough really staff hours to you know perform a diligent review based on they call this the shotgun clock we've got 30 days to provide comments so we've got new use specific standards for wireless facilities we've created some new definitions it promotes the sharing or co-location. And what I mean by co-location, if you look at the tower here, there's two carriers. You can see there's two antennas on the top. So basically promote the, to make sure the tower is strong enough to cover multiple antennas. And um, that way we don't have to have as many towers. Although this is kind of the old style of tower versus the new smaller style, style of tower. But I'll get into some standards for the smaller ones here in a moment. We want to make sure that our flight path overlay district, which is basically the approaches to the air station, remain free and clear so we have maximum height standards within certain districts, which is our flight path overlay district in Jacksonville, where you cannot have anything taller than 100 feet, and also have consistent installations throughout the city. They have to provide evidence that the new tower, if they're proposing a new tower, they have to provide evidence that there's no other location to co-locate. Uh, the desired height is needed based on evidence, not just, well, we want a 150-footer, you know, when we could really get by with an 80-foot tall tower. Uh, we want to make sure that they're least visually intrusive, and we also want them to use the largest search ring possible to make sure that there's no other locations for the, the antennas to co-locate at another location already. The new towers have to be monopole, which is what we mostly have. That's where it's just basically one, you know, more condensed pole versus the Derrick-style towers or the guide facilities. There's also provisions that we could have a balloon test, and basically it's just as it sounds. They would fly a balloon up in the air so that people in the area could see the balloon and call City Hall and say, hey, what was this balloon doing? So, well, that's where our proposed tower is going to be, and that's the height in which it will be. And uh, as a result, we may have a neighborhood meeting if uh, there's neighbors that are concerned about the balloon and, and a possible tower going at the location. Another provision that we added was uh, standards for lighting. And basically around here, because of the military mission, the, the, the Camp Lejeune and the folks at the air station have told us that they want an amber light. And we prohibit white lights because of the, the white strobe is pretty intense, uh, especially to adjoiners. Uh, 
folks in the area. So the base wants an amber light at the top, so we have that standard written in the code so that we don't have to ask for it each time a permit comes in. It's written in the code. They know it ahead of time, and it's a requirement for them to install it, even though the FAA may not require it. And we also have a, a provision for relief, and that's one of the things that uh, our, the consulting firm mentioned to us is if you have the provision to provide relief, it makes the ordinance very defendable in terms of, you know, a court case. So the other thing, because of all the new uh, right-of-way towers, if you will, um, one of the things that we created was some standards for the installation of those facilities. And those standards are 35 feet in height, which is in line with what most of the towers, are, you know, the, the existing utility towers are now, or the poles. Uh, cabinets consistent with size of DOT boxes. We want green poles. We don't want any chemicals leaching into the ground. And we want them to basically be indiscernible at 250 feet. And this is an example of what they call an e-pole. And this is in Wake Forest, North Carolina, so just north of Raleigh. This is an example of one that's a self-contained unit. It looks pretty sleek. So we know that uh, it's, it's about finding a compromise. We know that we need this because of the demand. But we want to make sure that we do it the right way. And we think this is a step in the right direction compared to the other examples that we shared with you. Uh, here's an example of one that actually has a street light attached to it. Uh, we don't want conductive poles, so we don't want them to be a lightning rod. Uh, we want them to replace uh, existing poles in lieu of adding a new pole. We've had several new poles added where, you know, we just set, we scratch our head and say, how come you just don't put, put it on top of the pole over there? Although there are some challenges associated with that. And then some standards to make sure that um, they're not prone to break off with wind or ice, more so the wind in our area, more so than the ice, but we do get ice storms every once in a while. So, any questions about wireless uh, telecommunication facilities? Okay. Do you have a map now of where their proposed locations are? Like, do you know the neighborhoods that they're going to be put in? or? No, right now, what you saw on that map is all that we've had a request for so far to date. So, Will you let, like if it was going to be in Northwoods, or will you let the residents of around the pole know when you're going to do your balloon test, or just so they'll be notified? Yeah, I'm not sure if there, I can't remember if there's a notification requirement, but I think that's kind of what the whole purpose behind the balloon is. I think there'd be a sign with where the balloon is so that if somebody says, what's the balloon doing here, it would kind of be, you know, a notice call oh, okay. to find out what's going on. And then through... You know, boards and commissions and G10, you know, mm -hmm. more and more of our residents will become aware <laughs> as those things happen. But the balloon test will be for your new towers. You probably won't have those for the small 35-foot tall utility poles. And for the towers, is there any discussion of making them more camouflaged? Like you've seen them on the side of the road before and they look very much like a tree? You can't see them. Interestingly <laughs> enough, I don't believe that we have, um, we want them to be least visual as possible. So, for example, what that means to me <coughs> is, you may not realize this, we actually have a tree one here in Jacksonville. Has anybody seen it? I didn't notice. It's I at Jacksonville Country it. Club. It's literally in the middle of the Jacksonville Country Club property. So you probably can't see it from the road. And even if you <coughs> did, you may not realize it because it is literally around a bunch of trees. So it blends in nicely. But some of these towers, when they are camouflaged uh, a certain way, uh, for example, if we required um, some of these towers that are 300 feet tall mm. to camouflage and they're 150 feet taller than the existing trees around it, it's probably going to stick out mm -hmm. more so than just letting them put up a monopole tower with a, a smaller <coughs> you know, antenna array at the top. So, you know, if it was in the middle of a pine forest, which we've got one of those that we recently had constructed all on Ramsey Road, it's not a camouflage because we didn't have any requirements to require that it be done that way. But it probably would have blended nicely other than the fact that it has an amber blinking light at the top of it. Mm -hmm. So... You know, we'll look at that as new towers come in. What is the least visual intrusiveness 
that um, strategy that could be put in place based on the location. So I think that's something that you will <coughs> see, but it's not going to be a, it's got to look like a tree because it may not be best to look like a tree if it's along Western Boulevard and there's no trees anywhere near it. Mm -mm. So, but that's a good question and, and we'll see kind of how that kind of works moving forward with this new code that was adopted uh, just a few months ago. I've seen one. Any other questions? All right, well, let's get to the fun stuff. You know, wireless towers are boring, right? So what's new? So recent developments. Everybody's been to Duck Donuts already by now, right? Mm -hmm. Nope. No? Everybody been to Aldi? Nope. No? Uh, Aldi's. Uh-huh. Aldi, Aldi, I'm not sure exact the correct pronunciation on that. So. Uh, it's two. I've, I've been to the Yes, one. we have two of them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Academy Sports. So these are, these are places that have recently opened. Mm -hmm. And here is the coming soon version. Another Starbucks? So we're going to get a Starbucks. They're looking at the southwest side of town, oh. over near the, uh, the Yop Road area. Uh, AT&T Wireless, guess where they're going? A standalone AT&T Wireless building. The old Pier 1. So I'm sure a lot of people are like, what's going to go in the old Pier 1 building? Well, AT&T Wireless is in the process oh. of going through the permitting process. Uh, Freddy's uh, Custard and Steak Burgers, that's looking to go out in front of the the uh, Academy Sporting Goods. Oh. Uh, it'll be a, a small indoor restaurant with the drive through Yay. Altitude Trampoline Park. Yeah. So the old Carmike Cinema 7 on Henderson, 1030 Henderson, I believe it is. They're in the process of um, uh, the, the planning or the permitting stages to convert the old movie theater to a trampoline park. So... Um, Looking forward to see that get off the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, Panda Express. Is, <laughs> oh, that, no pun intended. That was funny. I didn't realize I did that. That was good. So uh, Panda Express is uh, looking to go in front of the the uh, Academy Sporting Goods as well. Vans is going in the mall. Oshkosh Carters is going to the left of Old Navy, what used to be part of Old Navy. Five Below is they're doing a, a building expansion to the left of Target right there in the shopping center. They're doing a building expansion in a five below. It's I think everything in there is below five dollars. So um, they they must do well because when I was when I was vacation in Florida, it there was uh, it was right in the middle of a fairly a very very nice development. So they they must do well because uh, they've I've seen them you know multiple places there. Uh, Jersey Mike's is going to open up another location right there beside Massage Envy, which is a recent new business. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Next to Longhorn Steakhouse. Yes. And then Ribeyes is looking to go in the old sharpshooters right there just north of Western Boulevard on Marine Boulevard. So, and we met with um, an undisclosed grocery store, another one right next to Academy Sports today. My. Yeah. So, they, we have an idea of um, what that's going to be, but... A lot of times when we have meetings with them, they cannot disclose, so they would not disclose who who they were. But uh, a lot of these have very similar footprints, so you can look at the fr footprint and tell pretty quickly, oh, well, that looks like a X or a Y or a Z. So, so that's some some neat stuff that's uh, that's coming. And um, with that, that concludes my portion of my long presentation this evening. Thank and thank you, you for having me and Gary and Lily tonight. Uh, as always, we enjoy coming to see you this time every year. Thank you. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you guys so much. We'll go on to our subcommittee reports. Miss Linda, you would like to begin give us your update from the okay. planning subcommittee. The Environmental Appearance Planning Subcommittee met on May 4th at 10 a.m. in the New Bridge, New Bridge Street Conference Room. During the meeting, it was discussed that the April cleanup, citywide cleanup campaign should continue through May and focus on large visible items. The subcommittee also discussed the need to build public awareness of the proposed disposal methods of hazardous materials by sharing specific environmental tips as follows. In June, Willie Saunders will do fertilizing lawn care. July, Grace Harbarch will do fluorescent lamps. August, Linda Smith will do automotive, automobile oils. The subcommittee was informed by the staff that 
four new adopter program applications have been received and are being processed. A list of available streets is being updated and will be shared with the committee. Staff also confirmed that the City Council has adopted a new audience related to storage of outdoor furniture. And our next meeting will be in July. Um, Suzanne has stepped out. So do you want me just to report on? Well, we don't want to overlook Mr. Else. Carroll there, but we just want to mention, if you would, there on Mr. Sorry. Carroll's behalf, there Excuse me. that um, <laughs> he, there's a document we put in your pack in your um, your document. There, we have had no nominations yeah. um, for more than three months. So your I responsibility. Got I got for that. You don't. You got to have. You got to fill out a form. No, no, I got answer on that. Miss Lily's little neighborhood, the uh, Bayshore and Belfort, they both have uh -huh. a process where they nominate within their organizations. Yeah, and I brought it to their attention that. that they need to bring their nominations or w their winners to us, yep. push on to the citywide. That's a great tip. Yes, and you can do this online. You don't have to do paper, kill trees. Um, you know, you can do that. You can download this form <laughs> on our website, or you can do it online as it was there, too. So one of the thoughts was is that um, if you all want to get in the van and go drive around and just pick some That's folks out, you know, we can do that too. But, um, you know, we really want you folks, when you see something, if you're driving around, Michaela would love to answer the phone when you just call up here to City Hall and say, take a note, you know, I'm out by Betty Shufflebaum's house and I want to nominate her house, you know, for best looking house. And so you could do that. And she'll she'll help get it started, and we'll follow back up with that as it was. So, Madam Vice Chair, that's what we wanted to say about that. I'm sorry, Patrick. I just can't stay on on the numbers. Mm -hmm. Susanna stepped out. Um, do you have any report other? That's the report there. Okay. Well, it says the 2017 Arbor Day ceremony was held on Friday, the 21st of April, at Tuara Terrace Elementary. The committee. Um, may wish to review the ceremony. If anyone has suggestions for improvement for next year, we can pass those along to Suzanne and her committee. Was anyone there in attendance? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Does anyone have any suggestions you want to pass to Suzanne? No. Or the committee? Uh, it was very nice. Uh, and we like I did, the way the um, school uh, presented their uh, singing and dancing. So I thought it was good. It looks great. Mm -hmm. Right there. Yes. <laughs> wow. Yes. I will mention, though, following that, um, obviously, um, there's going to be some education moments. We met with the State Forester. We've reported this at previous meetings, and so there's there. I'll also mention we've had no memorials or honors in the last um, 90 days. And so we want you all to have this. This is downloadable on the web. Um, you can also get copies here at City Hall. Um, these are our programs. If you want to give something for this is graduation season, so it's a great time. We've had several people that give trees in the past in honor of someone's graduation from mm -hmm. college or high school or some other program. Um, those are available for you as it is. And then the program that we really want to push is the seasonal planning selection. Um, again, you can have the dedicated to Aussie Keys at the Riverwalk Crossing Park, those beautiful plantings. Um, you can do that for a mere $2,500. And you'll have your name up there for the season. <laughs> and, um, you know, that, that, you that part, you know, that, that's to do $2,500 is the entire park. The entire park. Now, where that goes, that funds goes back into the program that buys those the trees, particularly, that we plant around the city that's part of what you like so much as it is there. But you can see also that... Um, you know, for a mere $500, you can have one of the pods down at the Riverwalk Crossing Park or one of the gateway signs. You can do the Freedom Fountain planting for $1,000. Um, that's that. And then we have the tree programs, and you can do that for very little money, or in which you contribute to a tree. Um, if it's not, you know, if, if you want a specimen tree, that's much more, and it's a tree that's dedicated as in large as it was. In the past, as you know, for whatever amounts were agreed upon, you got a tree. Mm -hmm. We can't do that anymore. Right. 
Number one, the trees are expensive. And two, the cost of the tree is more than just that that you, if you see them at Lowe's or at you know Pumpkin Center or whatever there, there's an, there's an additional cost. And they want to buy trees that are more mature that you ensure their survival. And so that's what some of that is. As well. But anyway, I bet you there's some beautiful trees that are approved on our matter there. And we have a list of street trees also that are approved as it was. So we want to mention that to you. Hopefully all of you all will fill that out tonight in honor our memory of someone and turn it into us and we'll help you along. Thank you. I did have one question though, since you mentioned my name. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, could you pay this in allotments or just you want one big check? I haven't had that question before. I'm confident that we can work something out there, but um, we need to check with the finance Honestly. gods <laughs> okay. and uh, make sure that we can do that as it was there. But, um, you know, I, obviously, um, you know, the point may well be is that um, it, it, it could be paid in some installment program or something mm -hmm. like that. But. Uh, you know, they've got to know the money's there yeah. before they go out and do the thing. Yeah. So that's where that is. And I will go on right on to the next item with the advisory board dinner. Um, obviously, we'd love to hear your impact. Um, since your last meeting, we had the advisory board um, uh, recognition. Um, you saw a presentation that evening. Um, it has been played um, for a, a lot on, um, on, on G10, and it's available on YouTube for you to watch at your leisure and, and just play over and over and over again. So we just want to have any further conversation. One of the things was about how to make this a more caring community. Mm -hmm. um, and we, um, we're always interested in doing that. We've noticed that, for instance, some of your colleagues and appearance um, committees and some of the other communities um, have some items that they do um, around holidays and things such as that, that they, they take that on as some sort of projects or something there. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff around here, the staff does. You know, I mean, putting the tr the flags out along the, the roads there and doing some things like that. But is there something that you all would like to do and be a part of it or something like that? This is a time to think about that as it was. And, you know, perhaps for Veterans Day or something like that as it was to, to kind of go from that in. Um, the other staff items, um, we, we just want to mention to you that um, the signage for the Beirut Memorial Grove is, uh, is progressing. Um, it's in a design phase at this time, and um, we're hopeful that we're going to have something um, back very soon to show you on that matter. And since Suzanne's not here for the advisory board, um, for the planning advisory board, um, I think you'll take it that Mr. Ryan kept you up to date there pretty much um, mm -hmm. um, for all those matters. So, Madam Vice Chair, that would take you down to the boardership, the, uh, yes, board members' comments. Does anyone have any comments or suggestions, things you'd like the initiative taken on? I did just buy a brick for my son and had it laid out here. It's a good thing. We've already contributed to that for our did sons you? and for <laughs> ourselves. We've already done that, yes. Well, now's the time for others to follow suit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you can pass the brochure out to them. <laughs> Is there anyone else? All right. Our next meeting will be on Thursday, August the 3rd, 6 p.m., same place. <laughs> there are no other questions, comments. Does anyone motion that we adjourn? Well, we first want to thank you for your service again. And, yeah. um, it, um, we we wish it. you luck in your new venture. Okay. So moved. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a second? Yes. All right. Meeting is adjourned.